Our scripture today, as we continue along in the Gospel of Luke, is found in the 17th chapter of Luke, beginning our reading with verse 20 and continuing to the end of the chapter. Once, having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come visibly, nor will people say, Here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to his disciples, The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. Men will tell you, There he is, or here he is. Do not go running off after them, for the Son of Man in his day will be like the lightning which flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so also it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, no one who is on the roof of his house with his goods inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two people will be in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, Where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. Getting in shape for what lies ahead. Suppose I were to ask you this question, how would you answer it? What is the central theme of Jesus' teaching ministry? Perhaps someone might answer, salvation. And another might answer, eternal life. And still another, forgiveness. But if and when you examine the Gospels closely, you will find that none of these is the central theme of Jesus' teaching. The central theme of Jesus' teaching ministry is this, the kingdom of God. Throughout all of his discourses, throughout his dialogue with both his disciples and with the opposition, he is talking about the kingdom of God. And salvation is one aspect of the kingdom. Forgiveness is an aspect of the kingdom. Eternal life is an aspect of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God's government. God's government on earth, God's government in the age to come, how God is going to rule or reign. And this is a particular day in our history of the world where there's a lot of focus upon who's in control and who's running a government. Just the last few weeks, we have seen a change in the government in the Philippines and in Haiti. And now uh, President Aquino is uh, head of a government rather than uh, President Marcos, and we wish her and the people of the Philippines well. But that's, uh, there's going to come a day when there will be a change of government all over the earth all at one time. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. What would it be like for that reign to begin? Let's say that the Lord decided to use Orange County as a test model case for how the kingdom of God would be, and it was announced that at Wednesday, at promptly at noon, uh, all federal, state, and local jurisdictions of government would cease in the boundaries of Orange County, and the government of God, the kingdom of God, would begin. What would that government be like? Well, I think I could give you some clues. The first thing that would go in the new government is death. It's out outlawed, no longer happens. Now, part of me goes out for all the morticians that need to earn a living, you know, but there's going to be a rehabilitation, job retraining program for them. And then there's going to be no need for armaments. There's a walk started in L.A. and it's in Victorville today to all the way to Washington, D.C. protesting war and nuclear armaments. Hey, no need for nuclear bombs. There'll be no nuclear industry. There won't even be any handguns. Jesus is quite capable of, ra of ruling the government with the word of his mouth. And there's no pollution. 
They've been getting toxic waste off of the Ortega Highway. No, no more toxic waste polluters or toxic waste dumps, and no more smog. In spite of how, how much we've grown to like it, it will not be here anymore. And there's going to be no police force no, and no penal system because there's no crime. Sheriff Gates won't have to worry about the injunction that was issued uh, against him by a judge this week that forced him to limit the number of prisoners in the Orange County Jail to 1,400 at any given time. He won't have to worry about letting prisoners go early. Yes, he, uh, the thing will become probably a luxury hotel. People will go say, this is, used to be the Orange County Jail. Isn't it a nice hotel now? They'll fix it all up. They'll need to fix it up. And, and no more, ah, oh, no more hospitals because there's nobody sick anymore. All the nursing homes are going to be emptied out. And um, then there's going to be no poverty. Everybody will have enough. That's going to be great. And, and if you like that and I like that, let's vote for the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a party label. But there are going to be some things about the kingdom of God in Orange County that some people aren't going to like at all. Uh, we all can identify with these things that are gone that we don't want, but the kingdom of God means that there is going to be no more unselfishness. And it means that there's no more immorality. There's no more affairs, no more adultery, no more fornication, no more homosexuality, no more abortion. And it means no pornography. And it means no cheating or stealing or dishonesty of any kind. And it means no chemical abuse, no drug abuse, no substance abuse, no alcohol abuse. And it means that no religious systems will exist which do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. It's part of the kingdom of God. And it would be great in that day of the kingdom of God to say, ah, I'm here, I'll never get sick. I'll never have a terminal illness. I'll never die. I'll never be separated from anyone by death. I will always feel fulfilled. I will always have enough of everything I need, and so will every, everyone else. I'll never have to worry about anything. I'll never have to worry about money. I'll never have to worry about my health. I'll never have to worry about the Russians. I'll never have to worry about things that go bump in the night. Wonderful. And. Uh, you know, those are the things we can visualize. Now, I'm convinced there are some things about the kingdom of God that it has not even entered our mind what it's like. One of the, well, I like C.S. Lewis, his favorite author of mine. C.S. Lewis postulates that before the fall of man, the animals could talk. You know, the serpent in the garden was talking, and people just dismiss that as biblical mythology. But, hey, what if God had made the animals with the capacity to talk? When, when our dog, Boomer, a few years ago was dying, he'd been with us for 12 and a half years, and we gathered around his bed to say one last prayer of thanksgiving for him. You know, if you have a dog in your family, that's an important part of your family. This represents considerable investment too. <laughs> Time and money and patience. And that dog had meant a lot to us. And uh, we just prayed and I, I just thought, oh, Boomer, that was his name. He looked through those hurt eyes and, and he was hurting. He was in a lot of pain. And I just thought, oh, he wants, if he could only talk to me, you know, maybe in the kingdom of God, you know, our pets could talk to us. I think that'd be great. You may not think it's great, and that's not gospel, but that's just, you know, it's an illustration of the fact that there are probably some things in the kingdom of God that are going to just, you know, be so great that uh, they haven't entered our imagination as to what they consist of. Give me the kingdom of God. Give me that realm of life and light where everything is beautiful and bountiful where everything is dazzling and a delight, give me the kingdom of God. And the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, when is this kingdom coming? And that's what we'd like to know. So Jesus gives an answer. He has a two-part answer. It's already here and it's coming. It's yet to come. It's already here, he says in verses 20 and 21. It's already here. The kingdom of God is among you. Or... It's just as easy to translate that. The kingdom of God is within you. Actually, both are true. The kingdom of God is among us and the kingdom of God is within us. What does it mean the kingdom of God is among you? That is, Jesus is saying, I am among you and I am the king. I am the one who has authority over death, who has authority over illness, who has authority over nature, who has authority over people's destiny. I am the king and I am here. The kingdom of God is among you. And also the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, because 
Jesus coming involves his taking a bit of the eternal kingdom, ripping it off, and putting a piece of it in our heart so that the kingdom of God is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and gentleness and kindness and long-suffering and faithfulness. It's something of heaven on earth. It's God's rule and his reign and his government in our life, which we voluntarily accept now. It's a foretaste of the kingdom that is coming. It's a hidden kingdom now. It's not externally visible. You can't say, there it is or here it is. And it doesn't come with observation or it doesn't come with visibility. Now, that word visibility, or the King James uses observation, is a word, a particular word in the Greek language, which is used seven times in the New Testament. And every time it's used, it has a connotation of being used in association with someone who is watching critically. That is, critically with hostility. And Jesus says, if it's your attitude to look, he's talking to the Pharisees, with criticism at me, that kingdom will not come to you visibly. I had a friend in college who locked himself up in his room for three days fasting and praying that God would do a miracle of some kind in the confines of his room so that he could believe in him. And if he wouldn't do a miracle in three days, he told God he would go out of the room and he'd never serve him again. Well, he went out of that room and it's been 25 years and he hasn't served God. He was watching the kingdom of God visibly. He was putting God to the test. He was defying God to act. He did not come to God with a compliant heart and with a submissive spirit, but it was a spirit of demand, a spirit that put God on the witness chair and wanted to interrogate him. And God is sovereign and will not suffer that to happen. But Jesus says, for those who look for the evidences of his kingdom, you will see it in my ministry. It's what he, what he says. If you're looking for the evidences, you will see it. The kingdom of God is among you, and because it is among you, it is within you. Then Jesus, in verses 22 through 37, goes on to tell us that there is a second phase of his kingdom, that is, a day when the Son of Man will come in his glory. And he tells us in these verses that there are some things that we are to have in our consciousness as we wait for that future and final kingdom to come. And the things he tells us are, first, things are going to get worse. He says, you're going to long for one of the days of the Son of Man. And it will not be there. You will not see it. What's, what's he mean here? He's talking about disciples whom he knows will later be in prison rooms. They will be in dungeons. They will be tied to stakes where they will be burned with fire. They will be in Colosseum rooms waiting to face wild beasts. They will be in those kinds of tight spots of life. And they're going to look back in that moment and say, Oh, if we could just relive one of those days when we were with Jesus in Galilee on the, on the lake or when he broke the bread by the shore and fed the thousands. Oh, if we could have one of those days again. But Jesus says, you can look with nostalgia back in your life and those times aren't going to come. Who of us at any age in life has not already looked back with nostalgia at some day and say, oh, if we could just resurrect that day. But life is sort of like one of these people movers in an airport. This conveyor belt, you get on it and it starts taking you. And I, I think of this when I'm in an airport on one of those conveyor belts. I think, That's life. Only I can't turn around and get off. It just keeps moving, and I keep losing hair in the process. <laughs> it's moving, and there's a sign that says, no return, and I can't go back. All I can do is keep going. Jesus says there's going to be times when you feel that way. And then he says, secondly, that one of the things that's going to happen is um, prior to his return is that people are going to go off on religious wild goose chases. They're going to follow this person and that person who says, uh, there he is or here he is. That is, persons who, came, who come to say they have authentic religious truth and follow their system, and you'll have enlightenment or nirvana or whatever. Jesus doesn't have any naive view that because he has come, everybody's going to fall down at his feet and worship him. People are going to continue to believe in error. Here he is and there he is. And that's the kind of the spirit of our age. Well, religion, you know, it's if you're sincere. I like the illustration of the university classroom where the professor of comparative religions is uh, demonstrating to his students how difficult it is to ascertain religious truth. And he's lined up a number of people to come in and give a testimony of what their faith means to them, and they're all of different faiths. And the first guy comes in the room, and he's real happy and snapping his fingers and got a bright sport coat on. And, He's asked to give his experience. He said, well, I was really living down and out, and I was miserable in my life. And one morning I got up to cook breakfast, and as I put the spatula underneath the egg to turn it over, I accidentally flipped the egg too high, and it landed on my head. And a feeling of warmness came over me. 
and suddenly I felt congruent, and I have been congruent ever since. I feel wonderful, and I'd recommend to you, class, if any of you are down and out and feeling bad and disassociated from the inner self, put an egg on your head, and you'll feel congruent too. And then the second guy comes in, and he's got a saffron robe on, and he's either following Hare Krishna or Bhagwan Rajanish. And he said, since I learned my mantra and learned uh, respect for my master, and uh, I've come into enlightenment, I'd recommend you try that. Then a guy comes in and says, well, I've get, got a religion that teach, teaches me to pray five times a day and teaches me that my basic mission in life is submission to Allah and I take a journey in my lifetime to Mecca, and uh, that religion is uh, to be commended. And then some guy comes in and he says, hey, man, since I started uh, snorting coke and dropping acid, boy, I felt groovy. And if you want an extraterrestrial experience on Earth, try this. And then the Christian comes in and says, well, since I gave my life to Jesus Christ, everything's been different. And I recommend you try that. Jesus lives. He lives within my heart. And then the final guy comes in. He looks at all the other people in the lineup, and he says, I, all these other people, I'm glad that what they have is working for them. Paternalistic, you know. Glad what they have is working for them. And they all needed a crutch. But there's some of us in life that don't need a crutch. And so I don't believe in any God. I believe you need to get a hold of your own self and use right mental processes and you'll you don't you don't need religion religion is within you your god is whoever you choose it to be and my god is myself i am the captain of my fate the master of my soul and you're sitting in the class and you're supposed to decide who's right and the problem is you're being asked to decide on the basis of subjective testimony who's to say one testimony is of more merit than another's all are saying this changed my life the difference is not our testimony, Jesus is saying, or anyone else saying, here is, here is truth and here isn't truth. The difference is the objective reality of his life, his death, and his resurrection. The whole Christian faith lies not for its validity in our testimony. It lies in his resurrection. And you can say, I don't feel that the law of gravity exists, but I would urge you not to try to see whether or not it does by jumping off a 10-story building. You will find out quick it exists. And Jesus grounds his reality in his resurrection. So Jesus says, after I've risen from the dead and validated my teaching, by my resurrection, don't go looking for this view and that view. You won't find enlightenment anywhere else. But people are going to go off looking at various religions. And then Jesus uh, says a third thing about getting ready for that day, and that is that human life is going to go on normally as it always has, until there will be sudden judgment. It's going to go on normally. And he, he uses phrases uh, or illustrations from the days of Noah and the days of Lot, as it was in those days. They were eating, drinking, and giving in marriage. Now, that's not sinister, okay? It's not sinister to eat. It's not immoral to eat. It's not immoral to drink, depending on what you drink. We're not here told that they were boozing it up. We're told they were eating and drinking, normal human activities. And they were giving in marriage, and they were planning and building. Those are the things normal societies do. Jesus says, that's exactly how it's going to be until the time when I come. People are going to be living normal lives. And there is going to be in the midst of that normalcy this message coming. The world is coming to an end. The Son of Man will come like lightning from east to west. In the midst of that normalcy, this warning is going to come. Give heed to it. Don't let the normalcy lead you to a false conclusion that things will always continue as they are now. A few weeks ago, January 28th, I will never forget that morning, nor will anybody here. For me, that particular morning, I was driving to work, and as usual, I had my radio on the news. And the United States was getting ready to send up one more space mission, the Challenger. And they had had delays on that flight, if you remember. And as I listened in the final moments of the countdown, I was wondering, well, I wonder if they're going to get this one off too. And as I pulled into my parking space, they had about 30 seconds left on the countdown, and Sending something up into space had become such an ordinary event for me and probably for most Americans that I wasn't even going to listen to the finish of the countdown because I assumed, well, they'll either cancel it or it'll go, but either way it'll be okay. They never goof up on one of those things. But there's something about a countdown that attracts me. I can't stay away from a countdown. So 30 and then down to 10 and then 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we have liftoff. 
And the minute they said, we, had, we have liftoff, I said to myself, America isn't going to space again, everything's all right, turned the radio off and went up to my office. A couple minutes later, Jewel, my wife, calls me on the phone and she, and it's not like Jewel to be falling apart emotionally, she is on the phone emotionally undone, weeping. She said, something has happened to the space shuttle, it looks like it's blown up. And of course, then we all saw it later. A normal day in America. And suddenly, uh, our pride and our hopes and the lives of seven people are gone. And it turns out, as the investigations have been proceeding, that there were people who were giving a warning. Morton Thiokol engineers, the people that made the, the shuttle booster rockets, they were warning, don't fly that thing. And while the commission has not yet established for sure the cause, there is sufficient evidence, at least, that the managers did not listen to the warning of the engineers. And because the warning of the engineers was not heeded, we had the tragedy that occurred with the Challenger. It's helped me understand what Jesus is saying here, because so often when you talk about judgment, it comes across as so threatening and often preachers, unfortunately, that preach judgment. If you took a picture of their face, it looked like they couldn't wait for God to act next. And um, that's not the case. You see, Jesus is like one of those, or maybe I should say the, the Morton Thiokol engineers were like Jesus. They were trying to get a warning through and nobody would listen to them that was in a place of management that could do something about it. And Jesus is saying to the planet, there's going to be a blow up. It's all going to go up one day, and I'm coming back. And it's going to happen on a normal day, just like January 28th. It's going to be in a normal day. And it's going to happen so quick, you'll never have time to do anything more about it. It'll be like two are in one bed. How close can you get to a person than to share the bed with them? Two people so close together. The one will go and the other won't. Why won't the other go? Because there's no time to change. Two will be working together. One will go and the other won't. Why can't the other go? Because there's no time. It'll happen that quick. It poof. And therefore, if you're up on your roof of your house and think that there's something inside, don't go down to get in. There's no time. And don't, if you've left something in a field, don't think you're going to go get it. There's no time. It will happen just like that. And what Jesus is really saying to us is instead of being involved in the blow-up, you can go up. And he wants to take that teaching on the future and move it into the present and say to us, knowing that that's how it's going to be, knowing that it's going to happen on a normal day when the Son of Man returns, knowing that it's going to happen that way, what, what kind of things are in your life now? The teaching of Jesus boils down to a simple question on this matter of the future kingdom. Are you ready to meet him if he should come this moment? Now I know coming from the church background I, I came from, I was never sure I could answer that question even though I had given my life to the Lord, so I many times got resaved, And we smile at that, those of us that came from that kind of a background, because we recognize now that our salvation is by the grace of God and not by our own works. At the same time, it is inconsistent with our faith and with grace if we're pursuing a lifestyle that is not like that which the Lord wants in our life, if we are living in our life in rebellion against the kingdom which the Lord has established in our life. And so we ask anew in our life with a kind of new innocency as we come to the Lord, are we, am I, Lord, ready to meet you? If today, this very normal day, March 9th, if this day you should come, am I ready? It will be too late when he comes to heal a hatred. It will be too late to back out of, of an affair. It will be too late to correct a lie. It will be too late to deal with bitterness and unforgiveness. So Jesus is saying, get ready now so that in that day you will be ready. It's difficult for people who fill a pulpit such as I do to talk about judgment. Our society isn't excited about hearing it and I would much rather talk about light and airy things that all help us be better people. But the engineer is sounding a warning in life and saying it's not always going to be this way. Are you ready? 
Are you ready for the change when it comes? Father, we all want to be ready. We don't want to be like those in Lot's day or Noah's day who didn't heed the warning. We don't want to be like Lot's wife who tries to stay attached to things that you've told us to let go of. We want to live for you and we want to be ready. You've taught us that there's going to be a major malfunction of the planet and that if we die before that major malfunction, that death is a major malfunction for us. All of us are headed for that major malfunction. Help us, Lord, to be ready for holding anything against anyone today. Help us to let go. And as difficult as it may be for us, may we from our heart forgive. If we're attached to any relationship which is not of you, we're involved in any immorality, I pray that there will be a repentance of that. For neither adulterers nor fornicators nor liars shall have their part with you in the kingdom of God. Judge, Lord, in our hearts. Separate us from the cancer of our sin. Help us to deal with life while we have life and to live holy for you that we might be ready. If there are affections that we have that are not of you, if there are attachments to this world in regard to finance and pleasure that you're not pleased with, we pray, Lord, for the strength and the help of the Holy Spirit to make the corrections that need to be taken. For we want to listen to you, the great engineer of the planet, the Son of Man. Help us to be ready. In Jesus' name, amen.